please welcome to the stage University of Colorado Boulder Chancellor, Dr. Philip P. DiStefano. So good afternoon to everyone, and thank you. Thank you for joining us for day two of the Right Here, Right Now Global Climate Summit. We spent yesterday exploring the impacts that climate change is already having and will continue to have on human rights. Today, the summit shifts to the question of obligations. What responsibilities does each level of civil society including government, business, industry, education, and individuals have to address climate change and human rights. As a former head of state and champion for climate justice worldwide, Mary Robertson understands intimately the complexities of those questions and makes a compelling case for placing the poor and disempowered of our world at the center of the conversation. Mary Robinson first rose to international prominence as president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. She is widely regarded as a groundbreaking and transformative leader who helped shape modern Ireland into a period of rapid economic growth. From, 19, uh, from 1997 to 2002, Mary Robinson served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, also transforming that office through high visible public advocacy. She is a founding member and chair of the Elders, an independent group of global leaders formed by Nelson Mandela to address the world's most pressing problems. President Robinson served as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on climate change, surround, uh, sounding the alarm as extreme weather events dramatically affected the world's most vulnerable populations. She served as vice president of the Club of Madrid, chair and co-founder of the Council of Women World Leaders, serves on numerous boards, including the European Climate Foundation, and chairs the newly formed Center for Sport and Human Rights. She was honorary president of Oxfam International from 2002 to 2010, and today leads the Mary Robinson Foundation, Climate Justice, a center for leadership, education, and advocacy for the poor and vulnerable in the world that are disproportionately threatened by climate change. She has taught at Trinity College and Columbia University, served in the Irish Senate for 20 years, and co-founded the Irish Center for European Law at Trinity College. A graduate of Trinity, King's Inns Dublin, and Harvard Law School, she holds honorary doctorates for more than 40 of the world's most elite universities and is recipient of the Indira Gandhi and Sydney Peace Prize. In 2009, Mary Robinson was awarded the US Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama. President Robinson has been recognized and continues to be an extraordinary, important, and recognized global champion of our need to find and forge humanitarian-centered solutions to the climate crisis. We are so honored that she has joined us today. So please join me in welcoming President Mary Robinson. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chancellor, for that very warm introduction. Uh, I would have preferred a slightly shorter version myself, but <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to begin by saying that I came a very long way, all the way from Dublin, to this right here, right now, Global Climate Summit. So I have to justify my carbon footprint. Um, I really feel that I'm going to have to justify it. 
And I hope to do it by making all of you as fired up as I was when I was leaving COP27 in Egypt a short time ago. I was fired up by anger and frustration and, frankly, the fierce urgency of now. So let me begin with some reflections on COP27. Hands up, those of you who were there. Okay, yeah, quite a few hands. Okay, and I'm sure online there are people listening in um, who were there. We saw an important breakthrough on loss and damage, which wasn't at all guaranteed at the beginning of the uh, conference at the, of the COP. Uh, it was the determination of the global south, of indigenous communities, of civil society. The elders were very supportive of the fact that there had to be a fund agreed at this COP, not more dialogue, more dialogue into the future and putting off a decision. And the important thing, I think, was that there was an agreement to establish a fund and there was a link made with reform of the international monetary system. And that's actually important because there have been commitments made. You remember the 100 billion that was promised at Copenhagen that still has not been realized. So when it's left to the COP itself, it's very hard to generate serious funding. What is important is to link the COP with reform of the international monetary system. There's a move afoot. Um, it's actually led by three women, um, uh, you know, in, in the sense that they're the ones primarily talking about it. Mia Motley, the Prime Minister um, of Bermuda, um, Janet Yellow, of the Fed here in the United States, and Kristalina Georgieva of the IMF have been more or less discussing that there is a need to reform the way in which the World Bank and the IMF interpret their mandates. They interpret their mandates to keep their AAA rating. But there's been a study done, which I think is a very remarkable study by an advisory group that was established by the G20 to advise, and it has advised that there are at least five ways in which the World Bank, the IMF, and other multilateral banks could lend far more for climate, for adaptation, and of course for loss and damage. So there is a possibility, and we need to link the loss and damage decision of the COP with this movement um, to uh, change um, the international uh, financial monetary system, which isn't serving um, its purposes uh, well at the moment. Um, there was no ambition to increase, amb uh, there was no move to increase ambition at COP27 by governments. Um, uh, that had been promised in Glasgow. Uh, yes, Australia, with a new government, did, um, before COP, uh, come up with a much better policy, catching up with other countries. The United States, you had this move to uh, very much uh, um, incentivizing clean energy, but not much on cutting emissions. So that's still a problem. And also finance is a problem, fin financing adaptation at a level that would echo the responsibility um, of the United States. Um, uh, the, cu the current commitment is to 11.4 billion, but that's not still, it hasn't gone through Congress. Estimates are that it should be about 40 billion. So, you know, it's kind of well below the level it should be, and I do understand uh, the political problems. Um, the fossil fuel lobby was there in force you know, I think 630 members, uh, very much in delegations, even in civil society, very much led by Saudi Arabia, stalling negotiations and preventing um, agreements from uh, being realized, and in particular, language about human rights, indigenous people's rights, women's rights, gender equality being reflected in various texts. There was huge energy and innovation and partnerships in the climate action track, which has been a feature of recent COPs, as I'm sure you realize, where 
uh, young people, uh, indigenous communities, a civil society, progressive business, governments work together um, with an extraordinary range of innovation partnership um, that you know, kind of makes people feel really excited um, at uh, the possibilities. And as a result, I came away from COP27 with a sense of what I can only describe as a terrible paradox. And the paradox is that we are on the cusp of a clean energy world. Clean energy is much cheaper. Um, yes, there's the investment problem and the, debt pr the um, high interest rate problem for developing countries. But nonetheless, there are more partnerships for task forces um, for just transition. We saw for the United States, we saw during the G20, which coincided with um, the COP, um, that Indonesia got a similar package for $20 billion. Uh, um, at the COP, Egypt got a package for green hydrogen. Senegal is in negotiation and other countries. So there's a move to help countries to move to clean energy. But while we're on the cusp of a clean energy world, which would be really extraordinarily better than our current world, because we would be free of the pollution of fossil fuel, free of the deaths from air pollution and indoor and outdoor pollution. Um, we would see the greening of cities. We're seeing it already in some cities that are more progressive. Um, e even gardens and farms in cities, walkways, cycleways, etc., public transport. We would see a rewilding of the uh, countryside, um, the re restoration and regeneration of biodiversity. All of that seems just you know, around the corner. We're on the cusp of it. Where are we heading? We're heading for a cat catastrophic 2.4 degrees warming world, where we know the scientific limit is 1.5. And that 2.4 degrees world is if every government and if every corporation and every investor did what they were committing to, if they fulfilled their full commitments, we are still at the moment heading for a 2.4 degree world at best. It's crazy. It's not sensible. And yet, we're not seeing a major shift in the public way of trying to change that. We spend, it's estimated by the B team of business leaders that I work quite closely with as chair of the elders, they've estimated that the world spends about $1.8 trillion a year on what is harming us, harmful subsidies, particularly for the fossil fuel industry, but also for the food and fuel and um, fish and, and other industries in the wrong way. Um, subsidies for major um, uh, uh, production. Um, so what are we going to do about this? Um, a number of us got together earlier this year before the COP, and when I say a number of us, I actually mean a number of women leaders. Uh, we got together and we talked about the moonshot. It's the year, it's the 60th anniversary of when President Kennedy said that the United States would put a man on the moon. This was in competition with Russia, which already had a Sputnik uh, flying around. And putting a man on the moon was impossible, but it was achieved in eight years. And as we talked about this, there was a kind of pushback that this was very male, competitive, technical. What's the feminist answer to the moonshot? So we dug a bit deeper, <clears throat> and we came up with something called the Dandelion Project. <laughs> the dandelion is the only flower stroke weed that grows on all seven continents. It's very resilient. Have you ever tried to get rid of the damn thing? Yeah, very, <laughs> very resilient. Poets write about it, I've discovered. I'm learning a lot more about the dandelion. And how, uh, actually, it's used in some soups and some teas and some salads in different parts of the world. So it's very nature-based, 
um, nurturing feminist, a feminist symbol, if you like, and how do you spread it? As easily as that. So we have decided that what is needed is a women-led global climate justice movement. Not women only, but women-led. <laughs> and we want it to be very light touch, um, very um, enabling of everything that's happening going forward. Um, and not trying to be a new organization in institutional terms, but rather a very broad, light-touch platform, which will bring together and make visible and gather support for the amazing efforts that are being made by indigenous communities, by young people, by progressive private sector, by lots of uh, initiatives, as I said, make them more visible, show that we are on that cusp. Secondly, and this is what's so important for this global summit, um, because we're human rights people, um, hold accountable governments, corporations, investment, etc. Hold them accountable in order to, to get that change that we need. And then also join, to, um, uh, join the call for reform of the international monetary system, which I think can happen in 2023. I think there's a real possibility of a, a reform that will make a great difference to the resources that would be available. So what does this mean for the human rights um, community? Um, I think it means one word which we know and we're familiar with, but we have to really rise to, the word accountability. Uh, you know, the Egyptians, when they had their cop in Sharm el Sheikh said it was going to be a cop about implementation. It wasn't really, not in, in the important ways. So we need accountability, the obligations of duty bearers. We need to bring some of the ways in which the human rights community holds accountable to bear on this broader climate justice world. And to do so, we need to understand and make more visible the injustices we're talking about. Because I think if we do that, we will start a kind of understanding of the moral imperative of climate justice. And, you know, I came late to understanding uh, the problem of climate change. I now don't talk about climate change. I talk either about the climate crisis or climate justice. During my seven years as president of Ireland, I never mentioned climate. I talked about the environment, talked about lots of things, but uh, climate change wasn't affecting Ireland. And then I became High Commissioner, as you heard, and there was another part of the UN dealing with it. And the UN, at, at that level, tends to be in silos too much. So I was in my big silo of human rights, rights of people with disabilities, indigenous peoples, gender equality, etc. Seemed enough to deal with, and I let the UNFCCC deal with the climate issue. It wasn't until after my five years as High Commissioner, when I started to work in African countries with a small organization called Realizing Rights, which was a kind of pun on the word realizing, that everybody should realize they have human rights, and those with power should realize, meaning implement, those rights. So we were working on economic and social rights, the rights that really matter if you don't have them. Rights to food, water, health, education. I was also, as you heard, Honorary President of Oxfam at the time. And I was quite shocked to realize that I'd missed the deep connection between the climate crisis and all human rights. The climate crisis in those at that period from 20, 2003, 2004 on um, was deeply affecting African countries, small island states, indigenous communities. And once I realized this, I realized the importance of talking about climate justice. And since then, I've realized the, the kind of different layers of injustice that we're talking about. Um, first of all, that the climate crisis has affected 
disproportionately and much earlier, the poorest countries, the poorest communities, the small island states, and indigenous peoples, and indeed poor communities in richer parts of the world, including the United States. Um, uh, and that they tend to be the black and brown and indigenous peoples of our world. So it's also a racial injustice. Within that, there is the gender injustice, which is very real in so many different ways. First of all, because women often have different social roles, different uh, power, different access to credit, sometimes different land rights or other rights. Uh, they're not at the table. Um, and yet, they're the ones that have to make their communities resilient, um, have to put food on the table, go further in drought for water or firewood, and risk uh, being uh, raped and, and, and sexually assaulted en route, etc., etc. There is a lot of evidence that in um, the quick onslaught, you know, the um, hurricanes, um, that women and children suffer disproportionately, and they can't run as fast, they hold their children, etc. Um, so um, we have to know that uh, there is a real gender injustice in the climate crisis. The third injustice is the injustice that young people have spoken about, so I don't have to say much about it, the intergenerational injustice. The fact that because my generation and the generation following, because I'm old and elder, um, uh, we haven't done what we should do. do. And now young people feel, um, you know, they're, they're speaking out, the children with their Fridays for Future are speaking out, but they can't change things. And yet they know, they've read the science and they're championing it. And they're saying, you know, you have to take your responsibility because otherwise we're going to have an unlivable world. And they're right to call out um, for, for lack of change. The fourth injustice is a kind of subtle one, but I think it's increasingly important, especially in negotiations like we saw at COP27. It's the injustice of the different pathways to development of different regions of the world. Um, industrialized countries like Ireland, Europe, United States, we built our economies on fossil fuel. So we should be grateful to the workers in coal and oil and gas, and in my country, peat, turf, but we should realize that we have to make a rapid transition, a just transition, out of those fossil fuels, um, because otherwise we won't have a livable world and we're headed in the wrong direction. So we have to have a just transition much more rapidly. And by just, it means funding for the communities affected. Funding, and there are examples around the world of how this is beginning um, to happen, but not enough examples. Meanwhile, developing countries, and I remember this because, as was also mentioned, I was the special envoy of the UN Secretary General um, at the time of the Paris Agreement. And I remember when it was introduced that all countries had to do their nationally determined contributions. Countries large and small, even small island states. Actually, all developing countries, more or less, wanted to go clean energy as fast as possible. But they pointed out, we will need the investment, we will need the transfer of technology, we need the skills, we may need the intellectual property. And that should have happened after Paris. We should have taken that up immediately and made the steps that are beginning to happen now with the just transition for South Africa and Indonesia and Egypt that I mentioned and Senegal and maybe Vietnam. And you know, it's happening, but it, it's so late and it, it's still not as much as it should be. Uh, and that's a big issue now. That's the anger of the global south about uh, the window closing and being told you can't use your gas, you can't use your coal, because, because. Um, but, you know, the different uh, ways in which different regions progressed. And the fifth injustice is the injustice to nature, uh, that indigenous peoples in particular have been, uh, you know, not only advising us about, but speaking out about as powerfully as they can. Um, I've been fortunate enough, I was the coordinator of the decade of indigenous peoples when I was high commissioner. Um, I listened a lot and then subsequently when I uh, became aware of how the climate crisis was affecting human rights, I listened more to indigenous peoples than anyone else on this issue uh, because they're right about so much of it. They're right about our relationship with nature. We are nature. It's not separate. We have to get back to that sense um, in our living 
that we are actually part of a wider whole, not separate from it. We're guardians of it in that sense because we're the people with the power to negatively affect as we've done so much. And uh, it's the indigenous communities that preserve the forests, that are guardians of the seeds, that have so much wisdom to share with us. But as we were discussing this morning, uh, they're very often not delegates in at the table and they find it very difficult uh, to bring their wisdom uh, to uh, decision making. So I think the more we talk about uh, the injustices, the more we will realize um, that actually this global movement, women-led, um, has to rise to the moonshot, the feminist moonshot. We have to link with the young climate activists, with indigenous communities, with progressive business. Um, I'm already linked, as I mentioned, with the B team of business leaders. Those business leaders are saying exactly the same thing I'm saying about, um, you know, they were frustrated at the COP. In fact, it was business leaders who led a preemptive um, strike against trying to um, erode 1.5 degrees as being out of reach somehow. It was quite a movement at the COP to say, look, it's impossible now to, to stay at the limit of 1.5. And it was actually business leaders who stood up and said, that this is not a target or a goal, it's an, a limit. It's a scientific limit and we must do everything to stay within that limit. And if we have to go above it, we must carb capture carbon and come back as quickly as possible to that limit, and we mustn't negotiate about that limit. Um, and they're right, because the scientists have told us, in, especially in that report um, after the Paris Agreement, when we got the goal of staying well below two degrees and working for 1.5, this had never been properly studied by climate scientists. So they were asked, what's the difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees? And I'm simplifying their report in October 2018 on special report on 1.5 degrees. But basically what they said was, in that time between 1.5 and 2 degrees, tipping points might occur. For example, the coral reefs could probably disappear. The Arctic ice might also disappear. And there could be a huge melting of the permafrost. And that would throw up not just carbon, but methane, which is more lethal in the short term. So the scientists concluded very clearly in that report, the whole world has to stay at um, not going above 1.5 degrees. That's the safe, the only limit, the outer limit of where we should be and must not be weakened or negotiated. And it was 45% reduction then, it's now 43%. So we haven't made much progress in cutting the emissions. And of course, the other side of it is um, we have to um, protect 30% of our land, 30% of our oceans, which is this conference coming up um, on biodiversity in Montreal under Chinese uh, presidency in um, a, a very short while. Um, I saw how we got that 1.5 into the text in Paris. It was actually a movement which is why I believe in a movement now. The movement was led by small island states in particular, because they are the most at risk with the existential threat of sea level rise. And I was part of the informal negotiations before the Paris Agreement, and I couldn't understand actually why the French presidency of the uh, conference in, in Paris in, in December 2015, why they were having so many of these informal ministerial meetings before, because they were very boring, very, very boring, I assure you. Um, every country said exactly what you'd expect. You could predict what China would say, what the United States would say, what European countries would say, what African countries would say. It was all their lines. But the lines of one man, um, because he was the foreign minister of um, the Marshall Islands, Tony de Brum, were the lines that got into the ear of the other ministers. He was saying, do you want my small atolls to go underwater? Do you want us to no longer be a sovereign people? Remember the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We're a sovereign nation. We're part of the UN system. Do you actually want us to move to Fiji? We've actually bought land there. We can move there. We could move to the United States. We've got some kind of agreement. Is that what you want? And what about the other states in the Pacific and Caribbean? You want to just eliminate 
nations? Is that what you want? And it got into the ear. And it was still, before Paris, not sure we would get the goal, including 1.5. Um, India said no, and other countries kind of hid behind India and let India be the front runner on um, it's not agreed. And it wasn't until at the conference itself a high ambition coalition was formed, which included um, Tony de Bruyne leading it, the European Union joined, other countries joined, then the United States joined, and more countries joined. And it was that high ambition coalition, its goal was to have 1.5 degrees in the text. In the street in Paris, some of you may remember, we marched for 1.5 to stay alive. A mantra, 1.5 to stay alive. And then we got the goal, well below two degrees and working for 1.5. We're now in a position, as I mentioned earlier, where on the best scenario of everyone imp implementing, governments and investment implementing their commitments, we're heading for 2.4 degrees. That is not acceptable. Not acceptable. We need a, a, a movement. Um, why I believe it should be women-led at this stage is there is in the women's movement um, an extraordinary degree of trust. Um, it's something that I've come to value very much because I'm involved in various networks. I'm part of fearless women, connected women, <laughs> dangerous women, <laughs> you know, all and on. Um, and, um, and, and I chair with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf the Women Leaders Network of the Africa Europe Foundation. And I could probably think of a few more networks if I really put my head to it. So women-led, but not women only. Um, uh, moving with all others, light touch, but working on those three things that I talked about. Making visible the doing on the positive side of helping us to get to this clean energy world. Holding accountable at all kinds of different ways, litigation, um, uh, talking about justice, talking about the moral imperative of moving, calling out, and a lot of organizations don't want to call out um, and don't want to name names. The elders, we are happy to name names, and I've been doing that. I did it in Glasgow, and I did it in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, and I will continue to do it, and so will my fellow elders. The human rights community is not afraid to call out, and that's why you are a valuable community of this movement um, to uh, use your skills, um, to have litigation, maybe to have um, the treaty on um, um, non-proliferation of oil and gas, equivalent to non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, and other initiatives that are, uh, that are being talked about. And then the third thing, we need reform of the international monetary system in order to uh, be able to uh, have the support for the developing countries um, to uh, make the change necessary and indeed support for developed countries to move out of fossil fuel with just transition. So uh, I, 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 I wanted um, to justify my carbon footprint. That's what I started with. And I'm going to come to a Q&A session uh, now because I prefer to listen to some comments and questions you may have. Um, but in order to justify my carbon footprint, I want to know, are you fired up? Yeah. Are, you, are you really fired up? Are you really fired up? Okay. I feel justified. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'd love to hear your views now, because that's always the, the more interesting than hearing my own voice, uh, to hear uh, your thoughts um, on uh, this conference itself and where we're going and how we're going. I gather there are expert holders of microphones who can find people who want to ask questions, so I'm happy at this stage. We will now take questions from the audience. We have three people with mics. We will start on the far left side of the room and move to the right, then repeat. If you would like to ask a question, please move to the aisle, raise your hand, and someone will bring you a mic to ask you a question. And hopefully you give me your name and what you're doing. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is Sarah Dawn Haynes, and I'm staff here at the Environmental Center, and I work with a lot of wonderful Easonerites in the room. Woo! Where are you? Yes. <laughs> okay. We, um, I also work on city politics, and something that you just said really struck a chord about calling names, but how do we also hold grace and accountability because so many 
of us still face a lot of hypocrisies. I was running late and I had to drive here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a bus pass. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, so how do yeah. we grapple with that when we fall short of, you know, these ideals? Um, when our leaders don't get it done, but we still need to work together, what have you learned? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. I, I don't think I would load to, you know, ordinary people too hard on this. Um, I think there are three steps everyone can take, and I do encourage that. The first step is to make the climate crisis personal in your life. It sounds to me as if you and your colleagues on the staff have already done that. And you know you've done it if you're recycling more carefully, or you're using public transport, or you're, you, even you've changed your diet in some way. Then you own the issue. You, you've done your bit. Get angry with those who should do more. And you mentioned cities. Um, I, I didn't mention them specifically, but they're a, a real um, uh, you know, area where change needs, needs to take place. Um, and the third thing, and it's by far the most important, is we have to imagine and talk about this world we need to be hurrying towards. Because this world we won't get to unless we get excited about it. You know, um, uh, people have to want, at the moment, um, you know, dealing with the climate crisis is seen as, I have so many problems and now they're loading me with something else. You know, the cost of energy is going to go up in some way, the cost of food is going to go up, the cost of this, and it's, there's a subtle trying to blame it on the climate issue. Um, I think we need to change that narrative completely and get really excited about this world that we need to be hurrying towards as we call out, et cetera, et cetera. And I saw you nodding, so I see you're already there. <laughs> Good. I, I, I'd love to get a copy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hello. My name is Genevieve Anderson, and I'm a student journalist here at CU. I've noticed a large divide between the student activists and older activists when working against um, climate change. How would you recommend bridging that divide between the older generation and the newer generation when there's so much mistrust in between us? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's interesting. I think the most important thing is to uh, break down that mistrust, to be honest. Um, uh, certainly speaking on behalf of the elders, um, we go out of our way to be involved in intergenerational conversation, not least because we gain so much from that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a learning um, across, we, you know, on both sides. And I, I, I mean, I, when I was at COP27, I spent a lot of time with young climate activists in intergenerational panels. And, you know, even quite young, challenging. And, you know, one or two of them called me out a bit and I had to, you know, try and defend myself. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think, you know, I think there's a, um, there's a very different um, intergenerational conversation that can happen now from when I was growing up, if I might use just my personal experience, because I was very influenced in talking about justice by a grandfather, my father's father, who um, had retired as a lawyer um, because of illness. Um, he had taken cases for the poor tenant against the landlord and all that, and he talked a lot about justice, and he had no idea how to talk to a child. So at the age of 10, 11, 12, I'd have long, fascinating conversations, and I felt like an adult, you know, it was uh, oxygen, but I would never have dreamt of saying anything to him. That has changed completely. And, you know, 10, 11, 12, um, there's a certain real awareness and a real perspective that's so important of young people. So, um, you know, I think it's, 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 it's really important to encourage intergenerational. And then it's not just the very young and the very old, because it's, it's the people in the middle, and they're probably the ones you're talking about. They're the ones that have more decision-making power. So we have to get them uh, involved in the... Con and, and, and aware of how... Uh, you know, I use the phrase of Martin Luther King, the fierce urgency of now, um, how serious it is, and how, you know, we're on the cusp of a clean energy world, and we're heading for a catastrophic 2.4 degree world at best. You know, I mean, I think we need to bring that into the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Please. Hi, my name is Anna Hall. Um, I work for Girl Rising um, and have the honor of leading the Future Rising Fellows, which is a, a group of female 
uh, climate activists, and we work on the intersection of girls' education and climate change. And I wanted to ask you if you could help us imagine what the world would look like from a climate perspective if every girl in the world had access to a quality climate-informed education. Well, I think it would, it would change a great deal because we know if you educate a girl, you actually educate her family and community. And that's, you know, uh, that's not just a cliche. Uh, there's a lot of um, you know, study and, and, and evidence of that. And uh, I, you know, I think it's extraordinarily important. It's extraordinarily important to educate um, uh, and uh, support uh, girls having access to um, health care, to reproductive health, um, to um, uh, be able to space their children. Um, in uh, many developing countries, part of the problem is the risk of losing a child in childbirth, the risk of a mother dying, uh, giving birth, um, increasing the number of children, increasing a population, and, and making it more difficult uh, to sustain. So for all those reasons, um, and um, you know, actually COVID was very serious for girls. Um, the elders uh, particularly focused a few years ago on early child marriage. And we helped to form, a, you know, a, 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 to enable a huge network of those working on early child marriage who had been um, below the radar before the elders came in, Archbishop Tutu and, um, you know, Grasa Michelle, and they're speaking out on it. And so we got this Girls Not Bride, Brides big network. Um, I've become very aware that since COVID and now because of debt, problems of developing countries. So many girls are back into early child marriage, um, back into out of school. Even some heads of state are saying pregnant girls shouldn't be in school and, and all the rest of it. So um, it, it is a very important part of um, this solution, um, this clean energy world that we're talking about. Uh, education is key to it, which is why it's nice to be talking here. And by the way, um, am I going to get a question from a man or boy at all? I mean, <laughs> it's been women so far. <laughs> There we are. <laughs> hey, um, I'm, my name is Sean Simmons, and uh, I'm an environmental studies student here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, yeah, one question that I have is that, you know, like in a world where, you know, in the last couple years, you know, we've had a couple major shocks to the way that things operate, you know, particularly around, you know, like energy, the way that lifestyles are lived, you know, and production and all of that. I mean, the first big one was COVID, you know, and we saw mm -hmm. what happened, you know, when everything shut down that, you know, that we could, in fact, you know, like yeah. make really big, fast changes pretty much overnight, you know, if we have to. Um, but, you know, like in the rebound from COVID, I saw that everything kind of went back as close to the status quo, you know, as we could get it. But then we had, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine mm. and, you know, once again have these uh, major shocks to energy yeah. markets and stuff. Um, so, you know, like right now I see that uh, one of the big focuses is to try to, you know, get as much fossil fuel as possible from elsewhere. But, you know, might that not be the solution? Might there be a different way, you know, we move forward, you know, given that, yeah. um, you know, global energy supplies are tightening, prices are becoming more volatile. And I guess specifically, you know, like how would you do that, you know, from yeah. the context of a country like the United States where it's gotten so difficult, you know, for people to even be able to reasonably talk to each other. I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen what's been going on in America over the last, you know, few yeah. political cycles on the news. Like how do you get yeah. a society like that, you know, to move forward and yeah. lead the world forward? Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, there was a lot in that question, but maybe I'll <laughs> no, it, was a, it was very good. <laughs> um, maybe I'll focus on, because you're right to reference it. Uh, yes, we had COVID, and we could learn very good lessons from COVID, not least that countries listened, by, by and large, to their medical experts, um, and that helped to reduce the uh, deaths and the illnesses um, through, you know, behavioral issues, first of all, and then vaccines coming on stream, et cetera. Um, we don't listen to climate scientists in the way we listen to health experts. We should. That's just one of the lessons from COVID. But the Ukraine war, um, the war, the terrible war of Russia on Ukraine, um, has, in the short term, undermined uh, any kind of real push commitment. Um, uh, Europe panicked uh, because it was over-dependent on Russian oil and gas. 
um, and is still slightly panicky, but is beginning to realize um, that um, it, it has to, in the short term, do things it didn't think it would do, like go back into coal in the short term, especially Germany, for example, um, extend nuclear plants they were closing, um, do things, um, buy gas from Africa or anywhere that they can in the short term. But actually, uh, one of the good news things at the COP, which I forgot to mention, so your question allows me to mention, was that the European Union committed to reducing emissions in, in Europe um, by 2030 by 57%, not 55%. Now, that's right. You know, it's global, it's 43%. But Europe and, frankly, the United States, but it hasn't happened yet, need to really seriously increase um, their commitment to reducing the emissions. And um, that's, you know, absolutely key. But um, the, the, the point I'm making is um, we have to make sure that this short-term response to a terrible war which has driven up food and, food and fuel prices and caused a lot of um, you know, problems of um, uh, cost of living, etc., and has caused terrible problems also in developing countries, and that's something I'm very conscious of, um, that it doesn't uh, allow us to slip from um, maintaining the science, maintaining where we need to go, maintaining the accountability for where we need to go. It, this is a temporary, um, uh, you know, over the next couple of years, until we have stabilized and at the same time, the fact that Europe is saying by 2030, we're going to increase the cutting of our emissions is a very good signal. And actually, the B team of business leaders and a network of women that I'm involved in called Fearless Women, um, we, we were involved in a summit at the end of October on Europe Energy Earthshot. Um, it was a three-day summit on solutions. Um, people came together to talk about how to help Europe in the context of what had happened with this war in Ukraine and the dependency on Russia for um, uh, oil and gas um, to help Europe to really move through you know, a broad coalitions of solutions. And there are various things. That, I mean, one of the um, panels that's working at the moment is working on um, making insulating of houses affordable and sexy. Now, where have you heard that before? <laughs> are we here? Sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. Let me hold it. Let me hold it. For I'm you. not sure where we are now. Hi, my name Hi. is Chris Bentley. I am a man, but I identify <laughs> as a boy. <laughs> Good for you. Um, <laughs> Good for you. I wholeheartedly agree <laughs> with what you're saying about women leading this whole thing. Question. And the question I have is, how can the women? get Joe Biden and other world leaders to declare a climate emergency? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, good, uh, it's a good point. It's a, it's a serious point. Um, sometimes it's done too easily and isn't a real commitment. I think the important thing is that if a country declares a climate emergency, it does it with X, Y, and Z um, serious consequences. Uh, I say that because, um, unfortunately, countries have declared a climate emergency and it's made no difference. So we need to be clear about what we're talking about. A real emergency is, a, I mean, the cli uh, you know, talking about the climate crisis, if we talk about it in the way we're talking about it here, um, should be, uh, you know, should put every country on notice that we're in a situation of emergency. As I said before, we have a possibility of going in the right direction towards a clean energy world, which will be better for everybody and more equal. And we have a real sense of heading, not just in the wrong direction, but heading in a catastrophic direction, you know, on the best scenario of where we're going at the moment, unless we change that. And that's why it's so serious. And that's why, you know, I think we are in an emergency time, the fierce urgency of now. Yep. But it has to be real. A, de a declaration of emergency has to be with real consequences. President Robinson, we have a question from online audience members from Leif Youngs. How do we get corporations to want to do the right rather than having to force them? That's a very good question and a very important one. Um, as I mentioned, I've learned a lot from being um, a member of the B team of business leaders. Um, 
they call themselves the B team, um, but in fact they are leading CEOs of corporations who take very seriously um, the uh, commitments they've made to um, uh, reduce emissions, to have nature-based solutions, to be science-based, and they, you know, they, they take a leadership in the broader we mean business um, because, uh, as, as, as they said, um, in, early, uh, in early 2015, um, January 2015 at Davos, the B team of business leaders came out of you like as a group and they came out with a statement which at the time was the first of any business group that they would be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and do it the climate justice way. And I remember Christiana Figueres, who was the head of the UNFCCC at the time, the executive head, she, she actually, her tears came into her eyes when she heard it. She said, this is, this is what we want. This is where business can make the difference. Since then, unfortunately, we still see far too much what we call greenwashing uh, in uh, uh, what um, um, uh, um, corporations are committing to. And um, a lot of that greenwashing is in what's called offsetting. And let me give you a small example of how I learned uh, the problem of offsetting. Um, uh, I was involved with my foundation that you heard about on climate justice. We were uh, mentoring a PhD student in Trinity and three masters of development practice students um, on a mangrove planting in Senegal that was very well thought out, very community-based, very gender sensitive, everything about it. Was, but in order to go to where in Senegal the mangroves were being grown, they had to travel um, each year for three years, they went um, to this place, traveling a lot on land, and they saw trees that had been planted, thousands of trees dying, you know, wrong place, wrong ground, wrong everything. The following year, new trees planted that were dying. The third year, and unfortunately, some NGOs have been complicit in getting money to do this from corporations who then have the offsetting. Nobody cares about whether the trees live or die. The important thing is a thousand trees, 10,000 trees, I've offset my carbon budget or my, my carbon footprint. And there's an awful lot of greenwashing going on. Now we've had a good study, as you've seen in the UN, I'm sure, by um, um, Catherine um, um, McKenna, uh, the former um, um, Minister of Environment of Canada, whom I know very well. Catherine chaired a very good group on uh, studying under the Secretary General um, the way in which member states were talking about getting to net zero. Was it real? And how do you make it more real? How do you make the, you know, how do you show the targets, etc.? I think we're going to see far more of this over the next few years. Things like Carbon Tracker, Carbon Climate Tracker, all of these organizations are going to um, make more visible um, the cheating that's going on. And it's cheating. It's, um, it's not actually implementing uh, commitments. It's per public relations offsetting that isn't real and um, uh, greenwashing, etc. And it, it has made people very cynical about um, ESG, um, uh, environmental governance, uh, social and governance uh, principles, which actually are very important for companies. They're part of you know, working for the sustainable development goals, etc. But um, th th there's a cynical response now by a, a lot of particularly young people because companies um, aren't fulfilling what they say they'd be fulfilling. So I just think the more we can get um, the proof of causation, the proof of um, what's happening, the visibility, um, and the court cases that uh, hold um, um, corporations as well as governments responsible, the more and more we have of that. And it's the human rights community in a broad sense that have to, be, have to take responsibility for that. And you know, I, I, um, that, we have lots of great questions, but unfortunately only have time for one more. Um, I'm Saro Piagbara from the Ogoni community in Nigeria. Um, of course, we've been involved in uh, a serious campaign against the, uh, the fossil fuel extraction going on in the Niger Delta, uh, and environmental protection is and climate justice. My uh, question goes to the question of uh, change of the uh, monetary system in the world, mm. uh, particularly with IMF and uh, WTO and the rest of them. The, for me, um, how are we going to achieve this when 
um, these institutions are the driver of capitalism, which is influencing the consumption and production pattern hmm. that we're seeing in the world. How are we going to address the question of profit in all this? Because this is the driver of the whole climate change hmm. crisis that we're seeing. I've had the opportunity of observing the Global Environment Facility and the Climate Investment Fund. And I still see that driver of profit hmm. being the key issue relating to even the climate intervention that is going on. Hmm. So how are we going to get this change in the monetary system done when the institution has still been driven on the same principle of profit hmm. and that? The second question relates to the issue of indigenous peoples. Of course, we have some excitement with the funding mechanism with loss and damage. We are very much involved in that whole campaign. But of course, you and I know that the structure and our that is going to be implemented is not yet clear. Are you going to add your voice to the fact that indigenous folks will have access to the funding that is going to provide? Because presently, from global environment facility to adaptation funds, all that is being driven are state-driven processes. We give limited participation to indigenous people in terms of access to funding. Of course, we all know today that indigenous also hold the key to addressing climate change. But even at that, they still need the funding to drive that. At the moment, that funding is not yet there. I mean, mm. it is just in small <laughs> number, but not enough to do the local action that indigenous people are doing on the ground. Mm. We'll be adding your voice mm. to the, that mm. whole question of loss and damage mm. when you also have access to that facility. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the two questions. On the um, reform of the international monetary system, I mean, I do agree with you. I made the point um, earlier that, you know, um, the world spends 1.8 trillion US dollars, according to the B team of business leaders. They've looked into it, and I believe they've done their homework. And, they, and, and you know, coming from that source, um, uh, it's um, to me, um, you know, it's a shocking figure. And a lot of it is the multi multinational banks, um, the um, uh, you know, still funding fossil fuel, still responsible. So we, that has to change. And uh, equally, on the resource side, and this is the side that is relevant to the loss and damage, um, uh, they have to uh, look at their mandate again in a way that's advised by this G20 advisory group on um, uh, being able to um, lend far more for adaptation and loss and damage far more for finance, particularly to developing countries, and still keep their AAA rating, which is the key issue for them. Um, of course, we also should see reform of the membership of the um, World Bank and IMF, which doesn't reflect the world. It reflects the world of 1945, <laughs> basically. Um, that, that's also a reform. That's a bigger, bigger, bigger type reform. And the elders are very keen um, that um, the way in which loss and damage will be implemented, the, the kind of fund will be one that will listen to indigenous voices, human rights, gender um, equality, etc. And uh, we, we, we certainly are already, you know, advocating um, the, the need for, for this. Um, it's not clear how um, this is going to go forward, but this next year will be very important before the COP, COP28 that we uh, try to make sure that um, uh, the way in which the uh, COP, um, the UNFCCC, uh, begins to deal with it, um, is different in an important way in opening up the voices and the participation and the listening to um, uh, those who advocated for loss and damage. You know, who were the voices that were strongest? It was indigenous communities, civil society, etc., um, who uh, um, were more determined um, some countries of the Global South didn't want those voices in, frankly. <laughs> but uh, that's another problem anyway. Um, but I, 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 uh, I, I, think, uh, I, I think it's important uh, that this was achieved at the COP. It, it, it was a really important breakthrough because it wasn't predicted at all at the beginning. It shows that the multilateral system can, in fact, work at that sense and come up with um, a, a solution um, after discussion, when countries realize, no, we actually have to implement this now. It was got to that point. And I think it was a moral voice. Uh, I heard a lot of European governments say, this is a moral imperative. We just have to go with it, um, to have loss and damage and have the fund. You know, and they weren't going to, but after discussion, um, they, 
there was a breakthrough. So let's, let's at least build on that. <laughs> As we close this session, let us extend a special thank you to Mary Robinson. Okay. And thank you, everyone, for attending.